what we're seeing is, uh, so the pressure that's on the very large institutional investors who have been in it for a long time, but still it's only about $50 billion worth of uh, farmland owned by these institutional investors. Uh, when uh, when they're under pressure, uh, they have to sell, but it tends to be these high value, uh, uh, these high value opportunities. Um, and, and it's in the permanent crop sector traditionally. Actually, what's interesting right now is that uh, there are a lot of properties on the market uh, relative to three to four years ago. Uh, so in this particular moment, for certain sectors uh, that we're looking at, uh, this uh, is a buyer's market for us. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. One of the top asset classes I get asked the most about here at ThoughtfulMoney.com is how do I invest in farmland? And if you've been watching this channel since its launch uh, late last year, uh, you may remember that we brought on the uh, lead partner of a firm called Farmland LP that is one of the largest uh, sustainable farming funds out there. Uh, Craig gave us a, a great uh, deep dive into farmland as an asset class and then let us know a little bit about the, the model of his uh, fund specifically. Uh, but anyways, I've gotten so many questions since Craig's last appearance that I've asked him to come back on the channel here and give us an update. Craig, how are you doing? Doing well. Good to see you. All right. Well, look, Craig, so um, you're managing director of Farmland LP. Um, Farmland LP owns uh, a lot of acres uh, out here on the U.S. West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, can you give folks just a quick 30 seconds about uh, farmland and its mission? And um, then I understand you and your team have uh, prepared a series of visualizations about uh, what's going on in farmland right now. Love to get into that. Sure. Uh, glad to get an overview. Uh, so Farmland LP buys conventional farmland and converts it to organic, regeneratively managed farmland as an investment fund. Uh, we manage about $300 million worth of farmland today. Uh, and grow about 40 different crops uh, on our land and really focus on adding value uh, to farmland by, for example, converting it from conventional to organic uh, farmland uh, or uh, planting and growing permanent crops like organic blueberries uh, and other crops like that. All right. And I'll, I'll try not to repeat uh, much of what I said in our, our previous interview here on Thoughtful Money, um, but I uh, just want to underscore for folks um, the one of the things that, that I particularly like about the farmland LP model is, um, yeah, you are basically your your soil builders, right? A lot of conventional farmland really, you know, can be seen as sort of strip mining the soil, which is why it needs replenishment, you know, with generally all these different fossil inputs uh, year after year, because you are draining the soil the way that conventional uh, farming does. You guys instead are actually building inches of um healthy, vibrant, uh, macro, uh, organic, rich uh, soil uh, in, in, in the way in which you guys uh, treat the land. Uh, and you're taking land that was largely, if I understand correctly, uh, a monocrop, a conventional monocrop. So it was selling for a, a very commodity driven price, meaning you know lower margins. You come, you heal the land. I understand the process takes about three years or so to convert it from conventional to organic. Um, once it's organic, not only is, is the soil and the land being treated better, but you can sell your product at a much higher price point. And I'm sure you'll get into this in your slides, uh, but the demand is far outstripping supply for organic. So from a business model standpoint, you're sort of like an arbitrageur where you come in, find uh, land that's that's being mistreated and basically hopefully trading at a, um, a lower valuation. You come in, you do your conversion, uh, all of a sudden, you've improved the quality of the land, and you're selling at a much higher price point. Um, there's some other benefits, but but is that kind of the core of, of what you guys do? Yeah, it's a it's a great overview, almost like you've uh, known about it for 15 years. <laughs> almost like almost, and as I, I should have said this in the intro, I should be sure I make this clear. Uh, I am an investor in your fund one and fund two, so yeah, almost as if I've actually had a stake uh, in this organization. Um, and you've also been very familiar with the, with uh, what we've been doing over the past 15 years, and you've seen it in action. So, uh, well, and, exactly, which is one, one reason why I feel so comfortable bringing you on here is it's it's something I've personally seen the progress on over the past decade and a half. That's right. And, and a key underpinning, the scientific underpinning to what we're doing is really switching 
the farmland from being managed as a chemical system to a healthy soil biology system. Uh, and that's really behind a lot of the land practices that we do, uh, adding cover cropping, increasing the crop rotations, increasing crop uh, diversification, adding pollinator habitat, a whole bunch of different things that we do, focus really on healthy soil biology. That actually makes it really easy uh, for us to get it certified organic. And the certified organic part uh, is what gets us those price premiums. So the healthy soil biology results in increased yields, increased fruit quality, for example, for our blueberries. Uh, and then that certified organic side uh, gets us that nice price premium. And what we've proven uh, with our model uh, is being able to buy farmland that grows those low value commodity crops, generating rents of $300 an acre, take it through a three-year organic conversion process, uh, and then get rents of $750 an acre. In fact, that's increasing this year to $800 per acre because it's so worthwhile for the farmers uh, and it really benefits our investors as well. Fantastic. And, and folks, I promise we're getting to the general farmland as an asset class uh, slides very soon. Um, but um, uh, what, I, what I particularly like about this is... Um, you know, I, I very much appreciate the um, the land improvement part of it. Um, you know, switching from chem a chemical system to a biological system, which I think is a great way to put it, uh, and leaving a better legacy in, in the land. Um, but I also love the fact, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people get into regenerative farming um, where their heart is in the right place, uh, but the business model doesn't pan out. Right. And what I really like about what you guys have done at Farmland LP is you've created a business model that delivers the, the type of returns that interest investors that allow this to become an economically sustainable uh, venture, as opposed to in addition to being an environmentally sustainable one. And there's all sorts of benefits from 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 that. Again, you know, the ecology and the, and the, the ecosystem and all, and all the way that that benefits, but also like the local job uh, and, and the local community, the local jobs uh, center. So. You know, with a monocrop farm, you need less workers in general because um, it's very mechanized. Um, and um, uh, again, you're growing one single crop where what I understand what you guys do at Farmland LP is um, you're able to um, do a couple of things. <laughs> one, you're able to make investments uh, in the property that an individual farmer might not be able to make um, because they're they're you're going to amortize them over the lifetime of, of the, the farm um, with all the different farmers that you bring in benefiting from it. So any one individual farmer, sorry, I'm going to start that over, Craig, because I, I made my argument backwards. Um, <clears throat> uh, so one of the things I really like is that you, um, as opposed to a monocrop where you're just growing one, uh, one product, um, you guys are basically land portfolio managers. So you you look at the farmland and say, what would grow best where, uh, you know, across this property? And so you grow a diversity of products, um, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, general produce, it has to get replanted every year. Um, you do a lot of crop rotation. So part of the pastures uh, lying fallow. Uh, you have livestock in there, um, you know, one, because there's a real symbiosis in the land between livestock uh, and the soil itself. Uh, they, they definitely help the soil perform better. Uh, but that lets you have ranchers on the farmers, ranchers. Uh, you've got permanent crop growers, like, you know, people that are putting in the blueberries you mentioned, or almond trees or wine grapes. So there's a much greater diversity of product that's coming off of the property, um, which employs a lot of different people. So the, the, the local community benefits much more from this, right? And you as a business person benefit as well because you have a diversified portfolio here. So if one year corn prices go down, well, maybe almond prices go up. So there's a lot more safety in the portfolio. So there's just so much, you know, I, I think there's just so many benefits from here strictly as an investor, right? Just looking at your, your financial return, but then you get all of these ecologically and environmentally benefit uh, beneficial results as well. So I see that it as almost like a like a warrant or an option on top of, of just the financial investment you get. Yeah, you're really getting to the heart of the uh, the core economic value proposition for what we're doing, the economic opportunity and need for what we're doing, uh, which is uh, that if you look at profitability in agriculture, it directly correlates with scale. Uh, and you know, the, the average commodity farmer in, in the U.S. has eight and a half million dollars worth of farmland, 
uh, but only makes about $250,000 a year. Uh, and they're kind of in that trap because they're uh, growing low value commodity crops and they have to compete on scale. And so they're, they might be looking at 5,000 acres of land. And from an operational efficiency standpoint, the most operationally efficient way to manage that is to farm one crop you know, buy the largest tractor, buy the largest harvesters, farm one crop year after year after year uh, on that. That's operationally efficient, but it's the worst way to get productivity from the soil. And so we looked at that and said, well, what's the best way to get productivity uh, from the soil to maximize yields and, and food production in a, in a healthy soil biology way? Well, that's growing at least four crops in the ground uh, and rotating them uh, over a 10 year cycle. Uh, on there. It's really operationally inefficient for one farmer to grow four different crops, different equipment, uh, different cycles, different customers, et cetera. It's complicated. And so we said, well, how do we have the best of both worlds? Well, the answer is scale it up. So get a large enough chunk of farmland uh, so that each of those four rotations is at the proper scale for one farmer to specialize in each one of those crops. Uh, and lease land to them. And so we and we manage the rotations uh, on that land. We get the land certified organic, figure out and find the best farmers for each of those different rotations. Uh, and then you get the best of all worlds. So we focus on buying at least $50 million worth of farmland in one tight geographic area. Uh, then we identify the best crop rotations and then we bring in the best farmers for that. And we lease out about two thirds of the land and about a third of the land we actually farm ourselves. So we're actually farmers. We do it at cost for the benefit for our investors, but we're growing organic blueberries, um, wine grapes, organic vegetables and other things like that. All right. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, um, didn't mean to turn this into a full blown commercial for Farm Model P so early out of the gate. But I want to folks understand um, your background and, and how you're approaching this. Um, and folks, if you if your interest has been whetted by the model here that, that Craig has just described, you're going to really like his general presentation here on, on farmland in general as an asset class. So, Craig, why don't we get to those slides? Uh, and then I understand that you've got an update on your guys' latest fund that we'll, we'll close with. Great. Uh, glad to. Uh, so, yeah, so I thought that I would uh, cover just a little bit on uh, on farmland as an asset class uh, and how farmland works, where the returns come from and the drivers of value. Uh, then uh, talk a little bit about some interesting crop price dynamics uh, that are happening now, just very topical uh, items such as almonds and wine grapes, give some uh, uh, insight into that. Uh, and then uh, some fun macro items, and we can talk about uh, corn sweat uh, and other things. <laughs> corn sweat. Okay. I'm curious to hear what that's all about. Uh, so just a, a quick overview. We actually covered a number of these topics already, but just a quick overview on who Farmland LP is. Uh, so we're one of the 14 largest farm managers in the U.S. and we're the largest focused on organic and regenerative agriculture, about $300 million worth of farmland under management and over 18,000 acres uh, uh, under management. We've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, we uh, and the core value proposition of converting to organic that we've proven uh, a, a, as a business uh, at scale uh, is that we buy this farmland at, uh, that grows low value commodity crops, generating $300 an acre, convert it to organic over three years uh, and get rents of $750 an acre. Uh, we can do even better uh, economic conversions by converting to other higher value crops like organic blueberries uh, and, and things like that. Uh, we have a great team. Uh, there are actually now 12 people in fund management and over 50 people in, in farmland management. And we're operating kind of three core hubs. So we have at least $100 million uh, in each of three locations, Northern California, uh, Oregon, uh, and uh, uh, Washington. Okay. Hey, before you leave this chart, I just want to quickly point out these numbers here because it goes back to my uh, point about you guys really being um, sort of arbitragers. Um, you know, in, in, in general, the, the average is increasing the um, revenue per acre from something like 300 bucks an acre up to 750 an acre through the organic conversion. But as you said, um, you know, th that's based on, you know, sort of whatever monocrop was there beforehand. Um, you can, through better selection of what to grow on the property, uh, can experience gains of, of dramatically more than that. And I guess an example you have here is 
about a thousand bucks an acre to up to twenty thousand dollars an acre after converting to certain types of permanent crops. So there's a wide spectrum there for you to take what the conventional land was yielding before you bought it to where you can eventually take that land in, in terms of a, an economic yield. That, that's right, and you know. Uh... I'll show you in a second that uh, farmland is a very large asset class, but 53% of farmland grows two commodity crops, corn and soy. Uh, so it's very much a commodity market uh, driven industry, but there are very real, opp very real opportunities uh, to grow uh, other crops that are very much in demand. We don't eat uh, the uh, industrial corn that's grown. <laughs> it goes to ethanol or feedlots. Uh, we don't really eat the soybeans uh, that are grown uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, but that means that there's wonderful opportunities and wonderful markets for all the food that we actually buy in the supermarket, like blueberries and vegetables and things like that. All so right. That's where okay. there's real opportunity. Great. Don't let me slow you down here. Let, let's get to the good stuff. That's great. Um, so, Farmland as an asset class, a uh, quick overview on this. Uh, so farmland is this wonderful investment uh, asset class. When you look at it that way, uh, there's uh, over $3.8 trillion worth of farmland in the U.S. That's about the same economic value as all of the apartment buildings uh, in the U.S. Uh, and all the office buildings uh, in the U.S. And there's some really interesting things about it, though, in that, uh, you know, whereas uh, multifamily is a little over 50 percent leveraged, Office buildings, well, it was about 78% leverage. Now it might be like 120, 130% leverage. Uh, but uh, that's a that's a macro uh, point there. But farmland, uh, there's only 13% debt uh, on the entire sector. So that means that whatever changes in interest rates we have or pressures on the economy that we have, you're just not going to have a whole lot of farmland uh, becoming uh, economically distressed and being forced to sell uh, due to due to credit market issues, so it's not correlated with the debt markets uh, or the stock market. Um, now, the uh, institutional investors who do have more of the debt on there, that's actually creating some opportunities right now because uh, with the rise in interest rates, uh, some of them are being forced to sell some very high quality, high value assets uh, at distressed prices. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, most, but, most of the market but, is not correlated. Let, let, let me just chime in here real quick, because I've heard you made this make this point in previous years, um, you know, comparing the size of the farmland market to, you know, multifamily or office. Um, yeah, uh, we're seeing right now in real time how vulnerable some of those markets can be to dramatic changes in interest rates. And, you know, right now, <laughs> you know, everybody's worried about the commercial real estate uh, reckoning that's going on right now and, and what impact that might have, not just in commercial real estate, but in the banking system as well. And look, I can tell you, if, if I were to ask, uh, you know, 10 uh, investors uh, whether they would rather own office space right now or farmland, I'm going to guess 10 out of 10 would say, I'd much rather have farmland right now. Ditto. Uh, I, I, I actually, my family, I grew up uh, doing multifamily investing. Uh, and we still have apartment buildings, and I love apartment buildings. Uh, but uh, really, I can actually get better value uh, in farmland today, and it has better appreciation prospects uh, as well. So it's just a it's just a great uh, uh, asset. And uh, you know, the, and the other thing that's actually interesting, there's a lot of institutional investors in uh, office space uh, and multifamily. Uh, the, it's actually vastly dominated by the institutional investors. In farmland, only 2% uh, of farmland is institutionally owned. Uh, so what that means is that there's essentially not a lot of competition uh, for uh, assets uh, that we can buy and really add a lot of value to. Which is great for you, a player right now. Is there also sort of a a Bitcoin type argument where, hey, the more institutional capital gets into this space, it's going to drive up prices of, of farmland. So the assets we already own will, will benefit from that wave. Yeah, a lot of parallels with uh, with Bitcoin, except uh, you can grow food on farmland. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, the uh, but as far as being a store of value, uh, it's a tremendous uh, store of value as population increases and farmland uh, supplies actually decline. Uh, it uh, actually even has some better dynamics than Bitcoin. 
All right. Yeah. Well, so it's definitely some advantages over Bitcoin. And hey, it's it's harder to put in your pocket and walk across a national border with, though. <laughs> yeah. And I do like Bitcoin. I uh, was mining Bitcoin when it was a dollar. So, uh, yeah, I'm a long term fan of that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, a lot of jealous people now watching this video. Well, I, I made a lot of money selling Bitcoin at seventeen dollars a Bitcoin and thirty five dollars a Bitcoin and one hundred and seven dollars a Bitcoin. So, you know. I try not to think about that too much. So you have some seller's regret is what you're saying. Yeah, it is what it is. But yeah. Uh, so comparing farmland with other asset classes, I don't have Bitcoin up here, uh, but uh, we do have uh, uh, other forms of commercial real estate. Look, farmland is a very non-correlated asset class. It's not correlated with the stock market or the bond market uh, or even other uh, forms of commercial real estate. Uh, and the chart on the right uh, really just kind of summarizes that farmland is this slow and steady uh, asset class, kind of the hare and the uh, the tortoise uh, in the tortoise and the hare, uh, where uh, farmland is nice and steady. Uh, during 2008, for example, you see commercial real estate, uh, because of its leverage, have a significant dip uh, in value, while farmland just uh, kept going because of its much lower debt uh, exposure. Uh, and you also see the S&P 500 uh, definitely outperforms during certain periods, uh, but also has those large downdrafts uh, as well. Uh, and over time, farmland is just a, 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 a top decile performing asset class over decades. Yeah, yeah, the tortoise definitely is winning the race against those competitors. Yeah. And the fundamental things that drive farmland appreciation uh, are uh, uh, increase in value per acre, so appreciation, uh, and then cash flow. Uh, and the cash flow comes from rents. Uh, over long periods of time, farmland has generated around 11%, like 85 years, farmland has generated around 11% uh, annualized returns, about half from cash flow uh, and half from appreciation. And uh, Part of these dynamics uh, result in it really being an inflation beating uh, asset class. And fundamentally, if you think about uh, what is inflation? Well, it's the uh, increase in prices of things such as food. Uh, and the uh, farmland values are based on the value of the crops grown per acre. So as food prices increase, the value of the crops grown on that land uh, increase, uh, and that uh, it's what leads in part due to its market beating and inflation beating returns uh, over the decades as well, beating inflation by about 6.2% over time. Fundamental drivers of this are uh, as other asset classes like commercial real estate uh, expand their footprint, you build more housing subdivisions or more apartment buildings or more uh, shopping malls uh, or industrial space, uh, they're usually being built on top of farmland, which is resulting uh, in the supply of farmland decreasing at the same time that population continues to increase uh, and demand for food uh, continues to increase. So these are very kind of positive fundamental drivers for farmland in the future. They're sort of sad societally, but they're very positive for, for farmland as an asset class, right? You've got supply and demand both working in your favor, shrinking supply, rising demand. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, it, that, that's exactly right. There's uh, There are a lot of good stories about uh, farmland and farmland utilization. There are some you know, concerning things when you start to look at kind of macro things or farmland being lost, uh, water pressures and things like that, that are really positive on the investment side. But you know, concerning uh, on the human being side, uh, it's it's one of the reasons why to us it's so important to manage that farmland in using healthy soil biology practices, so that these assets continue to appreciate uh, in the future and basically are capable of uh, feeding my kids and your kids and everyone's kids in the future. Uh, that's the real kind of long-term value of the asset uh, and making it more profitable, more valuable today while we're increasing the quality of that asset uh, is really kind of foundational to what we're doing. Thanks. I, I, if you hadn't mentioned that, I was going to mention the same thing, which is, you know, just looking at this um, rising population, shrinking acreage, that just means that every remaining acre is becoming increasingly dear 
uh, in terms of its value to society. And so we would much rather have those remaining acres be treated as best as possible, as opposed to being continually strip mined. So it's, it's you know, our hope is that more players like you who, who take a, a land um, stewardship role, you know, come into the picture here over time. You know, and I'll extend that one further, which is that uh, the, I, I'm, we started this not expecting any benefit whatsoever from the government uh, in terms of crop subsidies or things like that. Um, and uh, now over the past 15 years, uh, we've actually seen the crop insurance programs, for example, cover organic agriculture, uh, which is great. It's a wonderful advance uh, and kind of a, an add to the model. Uh, what we're seeing uh, is across the whole uh, U.S. basically is increasing claims for crop insurance uh, due to increasing weather events and things like that. So uh, what that what that means is that uh, we're seeing uh, increased pressure uh, on food production, uh, which is concerning to some extent, uh, but very nice to have the U.S. crop insurance programs uh, in place. They just keep farmers uh, farming uh, throughout any of those cycles. Okay, so are you? Are you seeing from you know, your purchase and as an actual land manager here, um, are you seeing more and more support over time um, from the government to make sure that you can be successful at what you're doing? And if so, is that like a bit of a subsidy to your model, like a, like a nice little tailwind you weren't initially expecting when you started this process? Yes, in general, the crop subsidies uh, are a, a very nice subsidy to the model. For example, uh, on our tenant farmed uh, land, uh, they generally have crop insurance uh, for their crops. And so if they have a crop issue, uh, they're able to get crop insurance payments and rent uh, is a covered payment under crop insurance. So uh, we basically have government subsidized rent. Uh, I wish I had that on my apartment buildings uh, or uh, the, our office space that we own. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, that, is, that is a nice uh, additional perk uh, that we have by being farmland managers. Um, we're, th these programs have been in place for a long time. Uh, organic agriculture, the way the programs are set up, you need at least 10 years worth of crop history in that particular county for that mm -hmm. specific crop in order to be eligible. Uh, and so now, because we've been doing it for 15 years, uh, we have that kind of crop history and that exists. So we're eligible for these really wonderful, extraordinary programs that uh, the US has had in place for a long time. What we're seeing now in general across the industry uh, is an increasing number of claims uh, related to uh, weather issues, for example. Okay. Um, well, well, I'm sure talk about that in a bit. And um, I think I've also heard you mentioned over the years that you guys have have discovered that you're uh, you qualify for grants for things like um, uh, irrigation systems that use less water, you know, per acre, uh, things like that. So again, it, it just sounds like the, the one of the nice things about the situation in which providers like you, it seems to be, are, are in, is the government is increasingly sort of knocking on your door saying. Hey, can I give you some money to help you be better at what you do? That's right. Yeah, we get grants, for example, that pay for drip irrigation systems, converting from flood irrigation to drip, uh, and a lot of other programs that we uh, do, like putting in pollinator habitat uh, or other things like that. So uh, we're, we're very active users of those programs. All right. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And, and, and I mentioned, I bring all this up, just folks, if you're considering investing in farmland somewhere, you know, make sure the, the organizations you're considering may have the potential to benefit from from some of these things. If they don't, you might want to ask yourself, okay, well, is that is that investment going to be at a disadvantage to maybe some other options? Great. So, uh, it, when we talk about farmland, we talk about sunshine, dirt, and water. Sunshine is great growing uh, environments. Uh, dirt is high quality soils that may be growing low value crops today, uh, but have the capability of growing much more valuable crops, but also water. And that means we're buying both the physical access to farmland with the physical access to water, as well as legal ownership uh, over that water. So we're buying farmland that has some of the oldest, most senior, most secure water rights. Uh, uh, and um, and the they're very, very mispriced. 
Uh, we often, we value the dirt and the water separately. We often feel like we're buying the dirt and getting the water for free uh, on this. Uh, and uh, we put up a chart of uh, one of the few water indexes, a, a public uh, water market index. Uh, and it shows that uh, this is uh, water between 2013 uh, and 2024. Uh, and it shows it cycling basically between $200 per acre foot worth of water uh, up to over $1,200 uh, per acre foot uh, wow. worth of water. Uh, and this is, and it takes three acre feet worth of water to grow one corn crop, for example. So one, one crop per acre. So all of our farmland generally has three to four acre feet worth of water rights. Uh, on it. Uh, and so in the future, uh, if there are continued water constraints, and again, agriculture uses like 70 to 80% uh, of the water uh, in a state, uh, cities use 10 to 15% or so, uh, as, and cities have the most junior water rights uh, generally. So as there are droughts and other issues, uh, we see basically water markets uh, being created like they have in Australia that will actually put a price uh, on the water and value the water independently of the farmland. Uh, but until then, we're very happy buying up farmland with great water rights uh, that, that don't fully reflect the value. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's almost like you're getting sort of free options and uh, that, that may have tremendous value at some point in the future. Um, I remember going out and visiting one of your California farms, I think it was in 2014, um, but during one of those periods where, where it had really spiked and um, remember driving into the Central Valley and seeing uh, on the way to the very lush property that, that Farmland LP managed, um, going by farms and see, it was almost like a patchwork quilt where um, you know, it was, it was um, crops, crops, dust crops crops dust and it was farms that that weren't able to afford water at these prices and so they couldn't water their fields and and it was amazing just how quickly those fields just became like dust bowls uh, without access to the water um and so being able to manage the cost uh, of your water uh, hedge against the increase in these costs uh, and also just be able to guarantee your supply which is where the water rights come in um, huge part of, of the consideration of investing in farmland. So I just want to make folks understand, to your point, you're not just buying dirt and sun when you're buying uh, buying into a farm. You've really got to ask yourself, what is that water supply like? How dependable is it? And how exposed to future increases in, in water supply are we? Yeah, and there are a couple of uh, investment entities that focus exclusively on investing in water and water rights. Uh, and uh, th they're fine, uh, but we find the best way to buy water uh, is actually to buy the farmland that has those great water rights uh, already. Uh, and you're generating regular cash flow just from the rents associated with that farmland. Uh, so uh, we, we do view water as a strategic asset that we're acquiring through our process. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk just a little bit about uh, some uh, uh, fun crop dynamics uh, on here. Uh, so uh, you know you have this wonderful farmland, and now you can now you can grow some some crops. Uh, and uh, I thought that the uh, a, a lot of crops just kind of increase in value. Uh, over time. And if you think about uh, almonds, uh, that's a crop that actually has been very, very successful uh, in uh, uh, expanding its sales from in 1995, from around uh, 370 million pounds uh, sold. Uh, and today that's over uh, two, nearly 2.5 billion pounds uh, of almonds sold. So really a tremendous amount of growth uh, over that time. And that means that consumers are, uh, are are buying these products. You find, I, I've sliced almonds in my salad today. Uh, you know, there's, there's really been a tremendous amount of market growth, but the price uh, on that has fluctuated uh, over time. Uh, and there's some really kind of interesting dynamics uh, uh, in that. Um, and uh, so for example, uh, when prices are really high, uh, the farmers next door to someone who's growing a successful uh, almond orchard is seeing all the money that the uh, that that almond farmer is making. So you know what? They plant a whole bunch of trees 
uh, on there. It takes five to seven years for those trees to mature. Well, you know what? Lots of the farmers uh, planted those trees. Uh, and all of a sudden, you have kind of too many uh, almonds coming to market, more than the market can absorb. So what happens when you have too much supply? Well, the price goes down. Uh, and some of the poorest quality orchards or the orchards that don't have a good supply of water uh, on there, uh, they might actually have to remove uh, their trees um, uh, on there. Uh, and so now what happens when you have too much supply and low prices? Well, that stimulates buying demand. So people will buy more almonds. Well, now all of a sudden uh, you have more demand for almonds uh, than you have supply. And so what happens? The prices go up. <laughs> and the almond market has been really a poster child uh, for a market that has had this actually really extraordinary, tremendous growth. Uh, and uh, the market's been able to uh, absorb it. Uh, and consumers still have a very strong demand for almonds. But over the last few years, uh, there's been a significant oversupply uh, and uh, the prices have gone down. And uh, in fact, some of the institutional players who have uh, great orchards uh, with the debt increasing, the debt rates uh, increasing, some of them are getting caught a little short uh, and it's resulting in properties coming to market. Uh, right now. Uh, and when we look at this chart, uh, we see uh, kind of the end of this chart where supply uh, has been dropping quite significantly over the past few years. And pricing uh, is at historical lows uh, going back uh, a couple decades uh, on there. And uh, so after 15 years of not investing uh, in almonds, because we didn't like these uh, supply dynamics, um, uh, we identified, so uh, one of these institutional investors went into bankruptcy because uh, they couldn't make their debt payments. Uh, and we ended up buying three great properties uh, at uh, under 50 cents on the dollar to its appraised value just six months ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, so great opportunities for us. And we really, and we're actually already seeing the price uh, increased from a buck 40 uh, to closer to $2 uh, uh, per pound uh, now. So we do, oh. do think we're towards the end of it. Uh, but, um, you know, and the land that we bought is actually right near uh, the 4,000 acre Burns farm that you visited. Uh, one of the properties is right across the river. One of them is five minutes down the road. The other one's 20 minutes away. So we're buying properties in areas that have great soil, uh, great water rights, uh, and buying it basically at dirt value, uh, but getting these uh, uh, these tree crops uh, basically for free. So um, that's fantastic. So, um, you know, over the past couple of years, past decade or so, you know, real estate prices have done pretty well, um, but if, uh, farmland prices have done pretty well. Um, and uh, yeah, I've heard people like Rick Rule say, you know, I love farmland, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's kind of the, 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 the opportunity that was there 10 years ago is really closed with, with, the heightened prices today. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, institutions have started getting into the space, even though there's still a, a very small fraction, 2%, I think you said. Um, but you mentioned that with, you know, higher interest rates and whatnot, some of these firms are, are now getting into trouble. I, I'm just curious, what, what's your assessment of this moment in time in farmland? Like, are there better bargains out there now because of this institutional weakness? Like, is this a kind of a bonanza time for capital that wants to get into the space? Great question. And it's a fascinating time uh, to be in farmland. And one of the things is in this $3.8 trillion sector, uh, you have different markets and different uh, subcategories. In uh, multifamily, you have your uh, your uh, sunshine states uh, and your uh, Midwest areas. You have class A, B, and C uh, buildings. Uh, you have small buildings and large buildings, and each one of those may be performing differently, domestic and international. In farmland, uh, you have uh, so Midwestern farmland, uh, which typically is dominated uh, by corn and soy and corn and soy prices. Uh, and in that particular market, you saw really a big run-up uh, and now it's kind of it's kind of flat to a little bit soft uh, at this point. We think it's slightly uh, over its skis, but we certainly don't see value uh, in there. 
But that market is very different, almost completely independent uh, from the market for apples or almonds or cherries or blueberries, uh, nut crops, fruit crops, uh, uh, organic row crops. These are all different and have their own independent cycles. And so what we see, uh, and you can broadly break the markets down into annual crops versus permanent crops, permanent crops being plants that you plant once, take a few years to mature, but then you harvest them for 20, 30 years or more. Right. Like uh, almond tree or blueberries. Yeah. It, it, exactly right. And so uh, what we're seeing is, uh, so the pressure that's on the very large institutional investors who have been in it for a long time, but still it's only about $50 billion worth of uh, farmland owned by these institutional investors. Um, but uh, when uh, when they're under pressure, uh, they have to sell, but it tends to be these high value uh, uh, these high value opportunities. Um, and, and it's in the permanent crop sector tr uh, traditionally. So uh, in fact, for our fund three, uh, we bought uh, these three uh, properties, uh, primarily dominated by uh, almonds. We're going to convert a portion of it over to the organic row crop land. Uh, but we also bought another property uh, at a a uh, 10% discount uh, to appraised value uh, that grows uh, organic blueberries, wine grapes, and hazelnuts uh, that we're redeveloping and taking the IRR from, redeveloping portion of it, taking the IRR from 8% to 15%. So there are uh, opportunities and we do see actually what's interesting right now is that uh, there are a lot of properties on the market uh, relative to three to four years ago. Uh, so in this particular moment, for certain sectors uh, that we're looking at, uh, this uh, is a buyer's market for us. All right, great. Um, just to, to make an analogy here, um, it sounds like it's not almost unlike, um, let's say, like the, the crypto market, right? When, when mm -hmm. Bitcoin's going great and there's a lot of people that have made a ton of money on it, um, you know, they're buying trophy assets, mansions, Lambos, whatever. Then Bitcoin goes through a massive price correction. A lot of those guys have to have to liquidate. So they're selling these trophy assets, but they oftentimes are selling them for you know a very substantial haircut, a fire sale price because they they, they just got to, right? And so for someone like you who is is liquid and you know has a very keen eye for the type of value they want to add to the portfolio, probably a really pleasant time in terms of your option set. That's right. And and about 40 different crops grow uh, on our farmland. So we are diversified farmland players. Each crop, each market uh, is different. We do it at scale. So we have a good understanding of it. A similar, uh, a market that you might think is similar to almonds is walnuts. Uh, and But walnuts don't have the same kind of uh, demand growth uh, in them. Uh, almonds just seem to be almost an insatiable demand uh, the more almonds there are, the more demand uh, increases, not so much on wal wal uh, walnuts. Uh, so it's it's really interesting. And then you look at blueberries, the demand for super premium blueberries is uh, unquenchable, even at an 85% price premium uh, for Driscoll's, for example, sweetest batch uh, blueberries. Driscoll's literally can't grow enough blueberries to meet that market demand, even though it has an 85% price premium. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, one more one more market, uh, and this is uh, this is interesting. It's it's wine grapes uh, and the the wine market. And the chart's a little complicated, but let me basically tell you uh, what it's uh, what it's saying here. You might hear that the wine grape market is uh, shrinking, or there's issues uh, with with the wine grape market. Um, and what's actually happening is that consumers uh, are preferring. Uh, uh, better quality wines. Uh, so they're switching from $4 a bottle and $8 a bottle of wines uh, to uh, $15 to $20 uh, a bottle of wines. Uh, and they are drinking less. They're, they might switch from drinking uh, two $4 bottles uh, to one $15 bottle. Uh, on there. Uh, and so that's what these charts uh, are showing. So this is, for example, uh, three to six dollar a bottle of wine. Uh, this is 12 to 15 dollars a bottle. And this is 15 to 
twenty dollars uh, a bottle. And what you see is is really significant declines uh, in the uh, four dollar bottle and the eight dollar bottle wines, right? Uh, so and and that represents a decline in the acreage, but it's a decline uh, in the acreage in the Central Valley of California. It's not a decline uh, in Sonoma wines or uh, Oregon Pinot Noirs uh, on there. Uh, and the consumers are, in essence, trading up uh, to uh, the growth of these uh, better value, better quality wines, uh, where you know it might be $20 a bottle uh, on there. Might be drinking a little bit less, but from a dollar perspective, uh, it's more profitable and more value creating. Okay, so just to ask a naive question here, so it's different grapes that go into, say, the the cheap box wines versus the, the higher price bottles, correct? Yes. So, All right. uh, and sorry, I'm just going to ask this so you can answer it in your in your answer. Um, so it's different grapes, and I also assume it's different appellations, right? Where you, you just mentioned a few different locations like Sonoma, which is where I live, Sonoma County uh, in Oregon, where there are conditions that you only find in those areas that that attribute quality to the grapes. So presumably it's not just the grape varietal you're growing. You probably have to own some of that that in-demand type of, of, of terrain, correct? That's, exa that's exactly right. And if you think of the, the growing conditions, so the wines, and it might be it, some of it might be the same grapes, but generally it's uh, different grape varieties. Uh, but the area that they're grown is fundamentally important. Uh, so if it's growing in the hot, flat lands of the Central Valley, uh, and uh, it's uh, mostly producing uh, sugars uh, in the wine grapes, uh, and then and some flavors uh, in the skins, uh, that's that's the tends to be the cheaper wines. Uh, what what makes really great wine uh, is maybe uh, warm hot days with a lot of sun, but cool evenings, uh, and that allows and and a longer maturation process, uh, and that allows the flavors to develop in the skins. It allows for the right balance of uh, sweet and acid uh, uh, in there. I don't know a lot of the technical things that happen, but it just makes for a more enjoyable uh, uh, drink. Uh, that goes well with your meals and and people enjoy it at, at various different degrees. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so that's where the geography, that's why Sonoma and Napa have the cachet that they do. Uh, that's why you, uh, you enjoy Oregon Pinot Noir, which is uh, a, a great wine grape that we grow. Uh, and uh, in, in our view, uh, Walla Walla in Washington State uh, is, people call it the Napa of the North. Uh, so you're actually seeing uh, uh, winemakers from the Napa Valley because it is heating up there. You are getting less of those cooler nights and people are swapping out the varietals uh, from the Cab Sauv uh, to the Spanish varietals uh, to better deal with the heat. Uh, mm. And they're seeing actually that the wine growing region in Washington state, particularly in Walla Walla, uh, has just ideal conditions uh, for growing these uh, high value crops, warm days, long days, uh, and cool evenings uh, that result in a very qu uh, high quality wine. So that's what we have 6,000 acres up there. Uh, and we have a good amount of land in, uh, in Oregon growing Oregon Pinot Noir. Okay. Boy, I, I know you want to bank through these slides and I, I keep slowing you down, but the questions are so interesting. I can't help but ask them. Quite right. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll uh, just cover uh, corn sweat really quick. Uh, <laughs> right, corn sweat. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so just touching on, just touching on macro here. Uh, so it's hot. This is like literally from yesterday uh, and uh, it is hot. Uh, in the Midwest uh, right now, like record-breaking temperatures. And it's not only hot, and not, it, the temperature is not only high, but you ha also have a lot of high humidity uh, as well. And the combination of uh, temperature uh, and humidity uh, results in heat and actually heat risk. It's actually much more dangerous for humans uh, to be in a high humid, high heat environment than just high heat on earth. You, you can be in um, a, a desert at 110, 115 degrees and be okay. Uh, but if it's 90 degrees with 90% humidity, you're in real trouble. 
Yeah. Right? Hey, what, you, you're preaching to the choir here, buddy. It's a big reason why I don't live back in New England during those hot, sweaty August summers. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I live in the Bay Area as well. Uh, so and and when you look when you look at the uh, the science, we knew it would get a uh, uh, warmer and more humid uh, in in the Midwest, for example, and we've definitely seen that happen uh, over the past couple decades. Uh, and uh, so and we knew that would have an impact on agriculture. Uh, so we knew that weather has an impact on agriculture. But what we're seeing right now is that agriculture has an impact on humans. <laughs> and uh, and specifically, what happens when corn plants get too hot? Well, uh, they do what's called evapotranspiration. Uh, they release water uh, from the plants uh, to cool off. It's basically uh, uh, very similar to sweating. It's corn sweating. I get it now. Yep. Okay. Well, and, and the corn sweating refers to what happens when it's too humid for that water to evaporate. Uh, it actually looks like the corn plants are sweating. Uh, the water can't evaporate. Uh, still, The plants are still trying to pump out the water uh, and it basically stays on the plant. It really looks like the plants are sweating. But what, what's happening now, so 53% of uh, U.S. farmland grows corn and soy. That corn, if you look on the left-hand map, is really focused in this region. And what's happening is that as the temperatures are increasing, the corn plants are, are releasing 300, 400 gallons of water per acre uh, in, in sweat, increasing the humidity of the area. The humidity, kind of interesting, fascinating. So, so we're having this really kind of interesting and unfortunate uh, humidity feedback loop uh, that's happening where the plants are actually making humans more uncomfortable uh, because of this, uh, because of this agriculture dynamic. So, wow. yeah. Does uh, that, does that damage the corn in any way to be sort of yes. oversaturated in water? Uh, it's not oversaturated. It's uh, they're, they're, uh, they get heat stressed. So uh, they actually reduce their production of sugars. Uh, they become kind of too hot to, uh, really photosynthesize effectively and create the sugars and and create a high, a high quality crop. So what does that does it end in? Do we do we still get the same amount of bushels? Um, they're just not as nutritive or are they actually smaller? Is it, is it reducing crop yields? Yeah, I'm not an expert on industrial corn, uh, but in general, heat stress will reduce the production, reduce your yield. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Interesting times. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, another slide we wanted to show uh, as well uh, was, again, this is the uh, corn growing region uh, on the left. Um, but we really are, if you look at the numbers, uh, seeing uh, temperatures actually have kind of already uh, increased about uh, 1.5 degrees uh, since the 1990s. And one way to think about the impact on crops. So we always look at everything through the lens of agriculture uh, on this. Uh, and so what happens as temperature increases? Well, areas become less suitable uh, for certain crops. Some areas become more suitable for other crops. Uh, and so uh, as the temperature increases, one of the things you can do is say, well, what crops would be appropriate there by looking at what areas are already uh, in that uh, higher temp, what crops are already growing in that higher temp region. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, Illinois, currently one of the uh, uh, largest corn growing regions, uh, as the temperature increases in the future, uh, you'll actually grow the same crops that they grow in uh, Dallas and Houston. So sugarcane, cotton growing in Illinois. Wow. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to kind of think about this and have that kind of longer than you know it, it's it's easy to look at hey what's growing today um it's a it's harder when you think hey what's going to be growing 10 years from now 20 years from now 30 years uh, from now and it it affects where we grow like it affects the varieties of blueberries that we plant uh, or where we buy farmland and if we're planting wine grapes and if so uh which kind because of these narrow temperature regions uh, that certain crops are optimal uh, for. All right. So super fascinating. You know, again, this underscores the importance if you're going to invest in farmland. 
one, um, be very cautious about um, the, the crops that your your um, property is going to depend on. You know, if you're going to depend on a monocrop like corn, you know, well, then you got to understand what the corn related risks are. And who knows? Who knew? But corn sweat, right, is one of them. Um, and then you have to be aware of just changing um, changing environmental factors that that may make growing that product more or less challenging as time goes on. And you know, Craig, I I, 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 um, I hesitate to mention this word because um, it's very triggering to people, um, and I don't want us to get into you know a discussion of global climate change. But in in agriculture, you just have to be aware of what is happening on the ground, literally on the ground, uh, on the properties that you own. And as you mentioned, you're seeing places like Washington State, right, all of a sudden becoming a, a great wine producing region where, you know, it, the conditions might not have been there 30 or 40 years ago. So you guys just have to be very aware of the on the ground reality of what can grow and what can't grow and where the, the trajectories are, what may grow today, but may not grow tomorrow. And so we need to be prepared for, if we're gonna replace that, let's start the game plan on, on you know, if, if, if conditions here change the way that, that some of these maps are showing they might, what new crops are we gonna start planting over time, right? So this is understanding the, the boots on the ground reality of the environment conditions is just core to the investing in this sector, correct? That's right. Look, we're we're very science based. Uh, so uh, I, my degrees in biochemistry and molecular biology. When I was twenty, I took a class in uh, atmospheric chemistry and oceanography. Uh, so, you know, just kind of a basic understanding uh, of that. You have a you have to have a hypothesis or a thesis uh, when you're doing this. You could assume that nothing's going to change ever, uh, or it's just going to be more volatile uh, within there. Or you can say it's going to get warmer or it's going to be cooler. These are all just independent hypotheses. Uh, and uh, you kind of just collect the best evidence that you can and make your investment thesis. As a business, uh, we expect it to get warmer and more volatile uh, over time. And then we make our investment decisions uh, based on that. Some areas in that scenarios are going to do worse. Uh, and some areas are actually going to do the same or better. Uh, when you when you kind of look uh, through the numbers, um, but saying that nothing's going to happen isn't isn't true. I, I'll, I'll actually answer that question actually by talking about oranges. Um, so uh, so uh, when you think about Florida and when you think about what crop do you associate with Florida, it's oranges, right? Um, and uh, when you look at Florida oranges uh, in two thousand, uh, they produced. 250 million boxes uh, of oranges uh, there. But what also happened uh, uh, around that time uh, is that the temperatures warmed uh, in the tip of Florida uh, so that uh, there weren't any more frosts in the winter. Okay, And that's technically the difference between a temperate growing region and a tropical growing region. If you have a hard frost each year, you're in a temperate region. If you have no freezing winters, you're in a tropical climate. So this tip of Florida, uh, where the orange growing region is, uh, basically crossed over the, the tropical region. The frost line basically went north of the orange growing region. Well, what happened basically by 2004? a tropical pest, which normally is killed off by cold, uh, uh, carried a bacteria, which is also normally killed off by cold, uh, that infected these oranges and wasn't killed off by the by the winter kill of a frost. Uh, and that was called citrus greening. Uh, and it destroys the crop. It basically results in green oranges that really don't have any juice quality uh, in them. Uh, and Florida orange production over the past 20 years uh, has gone from 250 million cases a year uh, to uh, under 20 million cases uh, a that year. That is unbelievable. And just for the folks that are listening on the podcast and not seeing this chart, I mean, this is just a precipitous decimation of Florida orange production pretty much since 2005, right? So in the past 20 years, uh, a little less than 20 years, um, it's what, been cut in half by 90%? Yeah, over 90% uh, reduction in production. Uh, and, you know, if you're a Florida orange producer, 
this has been uh, devastating for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether you believe in climate change, don't believe in climate change, whatever, it doesn't affect the facts of the outcome here uh, and the facts of the cause uh, of it. So we have a very science-driven approach. We assume that these things are possible. Uh, in some cases, likely uh, the USDA uh, uh, expects a reduction in global food production of up to 30% by 2050 uh, due to these kinds of uh, weather uh, and, and heat and water related uh, issues. So for us, the opportunity to buy farmland, own farmland and be producing food in regions that are going to, is just so important, uh, especially as you roll forward to the future where we may have a more food constrained uh, world. The US is very, very kind of safe from, not safe, but insulated from some of these trends because we have so much uh, farming capacity, uh, but will be impacted. It, it also could have global impacts as well. Even if that doesn't happen, it's a great asset class, uh, but these are things that really, I think as investors, you do have to think about. Yeah, I, I think the hook was in for most folks before that stat, but but sorry, you said it, it is forecast that global food production could decrease by as much as 30%, you said, by 2050? 12 to so, 29%. Okay. So here's a slide. So the USDA expects between a 12 and a 29% decrease in global crop yields due to temperature and moisture changes by 2050. The problem with this slide uh, is that the data that they're basing their 2050 uh, on uh, is actually happening much more quickly uh, than that. Ah, so, so it could um, even be worse. So, yeah. But, okay. Uh, but but the but the general trends just acknowledged. Uh, it's just agronomic science. <laughs> um, so. Okay. But but what a what a massive. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to put my ruthless capitalist lens on here for a second. I'm going to I'm going to for for a moment I'm I'm going to be immune to human suffering. Um, what an amazing tailwind to have at, at the back of your asset, right, is the fact that it is an essential asset for, for life uh, that is going to become, it, it has a potential to become dramatically less scarce on a planetary basis. Um, so you would imagine that demand, you know, will, will commensurately um, spike as a result. Um, now putting my, <laughs> taking those lens off and putting my heart back into my chest, you know, <laughs> then you really want to be supporting systems that protect our ability to produce food, especially good, healthy food, so that we can combat this dire prediction. Very well said. In our view, it's both an economic and a moral imperative to manage farmland in a way to produce the maximum amount of high quality food over the coming decades. Uh, and so, and that's, you know, in a lot of ways, what our business is set up to do, to buy high quality farmland, convert it from growing industrial corn, which gets turned into ethanol uh, or goes to feedlots and convert it into high quality food. Uh, and uh, that has, uh, you know, great returns on the economic side. Uh, and also to us is just hugely important as we see kind of increased uh, weather extremes uh, and issues with water, continued loss of farmland, and these other factors. Okay. So, uh, Craig, I'm looking at the time here, and I'm realizing we're, we're running out of time fast. So, um, two last things I want to talk with you about. Um, so, I got to imagine for folks that have, have watched or listened this far in, you know, they're, they're, they're finding all this really compelling. Farmland has been a challenging asset historically for um, the regular investor to invest in, um, short of going and buying a farm, which most regular investors are, are, are not gonna do. Um, can we talk super briefly about the options that are available to the regular independent investor here? Um, and then uh, we can talk about your fund three, which I understand um, you, you, know, you launched at the beginning of the year. A little I've heard from you is it's it's doing quite well uh, in terms of you know, capital raising and whatnot. But you're still um, you're still open to taking capital for that, and then also just have some interesting news about the fund. So I'll give you a chance to talk about that too for folks that might want to look at Farmland LP specifically. But before we talk about your fund, what other options are are, are out there short of buying a farm for the, the individual investor? 
Yeah, that's great. And it's it's a because there's only 2% institutional ownership, it is pretty challenging to invest. There's not a lot of managers uh, in the space to invest with. Uh, there's a couple of publicly traded funds. Uh, one of them we like, one of them uh, I just won't talk about. Uh, but uh, the um, uh, so uh, Gladstone Land, for example, is a publicly traded uh, fund. That's pretty good. It depends We've seen the value of that REIT be at sometimes double the value of the underlying farmland. So you really have to pick your entry points uh, on that. And you really have to understand kind of what the valuation is compared to the uh, underlying farmland. There's some uh, private uh, options. If you uh, generally more for accredited investors, uh, some of the uh, uh, fractional sale groups will sell you an individual farm, like pieces of an individual farm that you can invest with, uh, acre trader farm together. Uh, like okay, that. great, um, I was about to ask you, yeah, okay, those yep. two. And real quick, you mentioned the Gladstone ETF. That ticker is L-A-N-D, correct? Just for that's folks correct. who want to check that out, yeah. That's okay. correct, yep. Um, and uh, and then there's another one, uh, Limonera, that focuses just on citrus and avocado. Uh, I don't have a recommendation one way or the other uh, uh, on that. Uh, but um, so uh, and then and then there's the private funds. If if you have uh, like mostly for institutional investors uh, investing between 10 and 100 million dollars, uh, there's institutions like Nuveen and, and other things. They might have um, they might have some smaller investment options uh, as well. OK. And and uh, again, just going back to the Gladstone ETF for a second, um, that I guess and even the fractional ones like acre trader and farm together um most of those properties in those those vehicles are more conventional right in other words um there's there's an even smaller universe of of funds that do the type of farming that farmland lp does correct yeah so to kind of compare and contrast gladstone land generally has uh, good quality assets but they do not add value uh, so they buy just cash flowing properties uh, and then just do sale leasebacks and get the rents uh, on there. Uh, and someone like Acre Trader may do some value add components, but typically you're just investing in a single farm with a single farmer uh, and not that kind of you know aggregated large scale management and value add management like we do. Got it. And I guess just to make it clear for people, you're buying one farm, might be only growing one product. Um, again, I, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, odds are probably it's going to be more conventional than than organic, but don't quote me on that. Um, if something happens to go wrong at that place, like there's a, a drought in that part of the state or, you know, a, a bacteria or a fly or whatever, you know, you have you, your whole property is at risk for that. Whereas if you have a fund like like yours and other fund, Gladstone, is, for example, there's a lot more diversification because there's a lot of different properties in there. So one particular property might have a bad year. Other ones might have a bad year and make up for that. Yeah. In general, if you're investing in agriculture, we want you to invest in 10 different crops, 10 different farms, uh, something like that, kind of at a minimum uh, so that, that you have that. Now we like doing that on a large scale aggregated basis. I hate uh, to say this, but you're telling people don't bet the farm on one specific property. It's really hard to uh, avoid uh, those kind of farmland puns. Yes. Hey, we're, we're we're both dads. All right. I think I think we're we're allowed to make a bad dad pun once in a while. Um, okay. So uh, getting on to farmland LP. So um, I, I mentioned your your fund tree, but maybe I should just give you the floor. W what do you want um, folks to know about your guys's operations, and and where should they go if they want to learn more? That's great. So uh, we're. Uh, raising our third fund right now. We've actually already raised, it's about $250 million uh, that we're raising on that. About a third of it is already raised. We've already bought uh, two, done two main uh, acquisitions uh, for about four farms, uh, five farms uh, in that. Uh, and so it already has kind of a good critical mass there. Uh, and then we're uh, in the process of raising uh, the rest of it right now. Great opportunity for investors to see how we've already invested and the kinds of properties that we will continue to be uh, uh, acquiring uh, in that fund. Uh, we're uh, with you, Adam, we range to have a, a, a webinar uh, for your people uh, on September 4th next week. 
uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, just email us uh, at IR uh, at farmlandlp.com. IR stands for uh, Investor Relations. Uh, and so just email IR at farmlandlp, put Adam Taggart in the subject line, uh, and we'll get you signed up for that webinar. Uh, and there we'll give you the details on Farmland LP, uh, uh, our fund, what we've been doing, uh, and also give you access to the data room so you can learn more about what we do. All right, great. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, full disclosure, the folks at Farmland LP have uh, kindly asked me to be the moderator uh, for that webinar. So I will happily do that. So anyone who's interested in that, I'll, I'll see you there on Wednesday, uh, September 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, just to make sure that folks' uh, expectations are, are, are adequately set, um, there is still a, a minimum requirement for people to buy into your funds, Craig, correctly. So do, do they still have to be accredited investors at this point? Yes. So according to the SEC, we're not publicly traded. So according to the SEC, all the investors have to be uh, accredited investors. So that means basically a million dollars net worth uh, or I think $250,000 a year uh, income uh, on that. Uh, it's very easy to get uh, uh, to get a letter related to that if you meet those uh, assets. Uh, and the investment minimum uh, for us, generally it's 100K. Uh, we can talk about a lower minimum for, for your people, but generally it's a, it's a 100K minimum. All right, well, that's very kind. Um, so if, if folks aren't um, accredited investors, uh, can they still watch this thing or is it is it limited only is the webinar limited only to accredited investors? Uh, so non-accredited investors can watch the webinar, but unfortunately we won't be we we according to the SEC, a hundred percent of the people who actually invest in the fund uh, have do have to be accredited. Okay. All right. So folks, if you're if you're interested in this, learning more, whether you're accredited or not, go watch the webinar. But just know that if you decide that you want to actually invest in it, there are the accredited investor limitations that, that Craig just mentioned there. And, and folks, you know, every time I talk to Craig about this, um, you know, I, I, I get and I, I and I understand this. You know, I get I hear people frustrated that, oh, you know, why is it only available to accredited investors? As Craig said, they have to do it this way in their fund, given the rules of the SEC here. And it's a it's an issue. Uh my opinion, it's an issue that there are, are so few good opportunities to invest in the farmland um, as a non-accredited investor, but it's funds like Craig's, I think, that are trying to kind of blaze the trail to eventually create um, products that are available to people um, that, that are non-accredited. And, and Craig, maybe I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but I, I know years ago we talked about some of your visions, and I think at some point you were hoping to create a vehicle that eventually... Uh, not necessarily your existing funds, but but at some point of a, a vehicle that could go public and be like an ETF like land around you know your sustainable model so that anybody with five bucks, you know, basically could buy into it. Yeah, so what what we intend to do, so we already have two funds, we're raising this third fund. Uh, what we intend to do is actually, once we're generating about uh, the, the lands go through the conversion and are generating nice cash flow. If we're generating a 10% return, cash flow return to the asset, but the market is happy with a 5% cash yield, uh, we want to roll those assets uh, into a, a cash flowing, publicly traded organic farmland REIT. Uh, and investors can, you know, if, if they want to just stay in, uh, that's great. Uh, if they want to cash out at maybe twice the liquidation value of the farmland, uh, uh, they're welcome to, but that would be a vehicle that would allow new investors to come in uh, from the public markets. Uh, we need about $300 million worth of that mature cash flowing farmland uh, in order for it to make sense on the public markets. Uh, and okay. so uh, that's that's what we're in the process of doing. We don't expect it to happen for the next three to five years or so, uh, but uh, that is part of our strategy. So having these kind of annual uh, value add funds uh, that are private, where we take it through that cash flow cycle, um, that, that value add cycle until it's generating nice cash flow, uh, and then be able to roll it into one big publicly traded vehicle. That's the long term vision. All right. Well, I, I wish you and the Farmland team all the best of luck on that. I know that folks who are watching who are not accredited investors, you know, are, are, are rooting for your success there as well, so they could hopefully eventually uh, invest in the future. And I understand that there's risk between now and then, and you guys will do your best, but no guarantees. But um, uh, personally, I just, I think um, the more 
we can democratize ownership of farmland in general. And then my opinion, the better forms of, of, of farmland management, like your firms, uh, I think everybody benefits. So anyways, Craig, thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, really look forward to seeing you next week, Craig, at the webinar. Um, and folks, if you are interested in attending that webinar, like Craig said, uh, send an email to ir at farmlandlp.com. Uh, put Adam Taggart in the subject line so they know you, you've watched this video and are interested in the webinar. I also put a link uh, to that email address right below this video here too. So it should be easy for folks to get. Craig, can't thank you enough, my friend. Great talking to you, Adam. Thanks so much. Right. See you next week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.